I'm Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I uh, have the privilege, therefore, of being the host today. And through uh, coin flips between Larry Olivier and I, I am going to be chairing the first session. Um, for all of you who were able to join us yesterday and who or will be watching the future videos and papers, um, we had a terrific start, more than a start, an enormous bounty intellectually in a relevant sense from the first day of Rethinking Macroeconomic Policy 4. Um, I am grateful to Olivier Blanchard and Larry Summers for not just leading the coordination and getting the people for this wonderful conference, but for providing such a strong intellectual foundation with their paper to start and showing their own points of difference. We'll be returning to that in a closing fireside chat. We may put a fire up on the screen um, at the end of the conference in a few hours. But today, we are continuing going from strength to strength. Uh, we're fortunate to have a panel on changing international finance and the implications for macroeconomic policy. Uh, yesterday, as mentioned, we did not take that. We got a little US-centric, which is useful and understandable but is not the goal ever, and is certainly not the goal of the Peterson Institute. And so we're delighted to have a very distinguished group speaking in the second panel today, led off by Gita Gopinath, but also including Raghu Rajan and Barry Eichengreen and others. Um, this morning, we take on the one issue of the 10,000 issues that Larry and Olivier put in their paper that they admit was important, but they didn't take on, which is directly, which is how do you think about inequality in the context of macroeconomic policy. Um, we have three of the most creative, independent-minded, and influential thinkers I know in today's economics to discuss this. We have an opening paper by Jason Furman. We have remarks by Tharman, the man who goes by only one name, um, head of, of the G20, uh, head of the IMFC and, of course, uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore. Um, and we have comments as well from Justin Wolfer, star of stage and screen, and author of soon to be the, the greatest uh, undergrad macro textbook is coming out from him and Betsy Stevenson. Anyway, um, one uh, mildly sad note, uh, Danny Roderick was also here, which would have added even more diversity and insight to this discussion, was supposed to be here. Yesterday he called, he has a family matter that has to be attended to. Um, we obviously wish him the best. I will just present Danny's slides. We have made them available in hard copy and we've put them online. Uh, it's obviously a pale imitation of Professor Roderick's views, but we definitely want his views out here and he prepared, so we want to have them out here. So now, Jason. Um, so, um, thanks so much. It's great to be um, here in my Washington home at Peterson to be invited to rethink macroeconomics. And I think as a spoiler, one of my main messages is going to be that I'm not sure how much macroeconomics there should be in the question of inequality, but that there needs to be an awful lot of microeconomics in the question. So, sorry, should have figure this out in advance. Oh, okay, I figured it out in advance. So the question I'm going to ask is whether policymakers should care about whether inequality is helpful or harmful to growth. Um, Heather Boucher, who cares a lot about inequality, read the first page of this and thought I was a little bit of a right-wing kook. Larry read all the way to the end and accused me of being um, a communist, and so my goal will be to try to explain myself better than I did on either the first or last page of the paper in this discussion, or else to win you all over to communism or right-wing kookery. So what I want to do, first of all, is talk a little bit about the cross-country evidence of the effect of inequality on growth. Then talk about some of the shortcomings. I won't talk, dwell as much on any of the econometric issues, but more the interpretation issues of the ways in which this research should and shouldn't matter to policymakers. Then we'll talk a little bit about a micro perspective on policies where all good things go together, things where you're helping inequality and helping growth 
at the same time. In some sense, those are conceptually quite easy insofar as we can agree on what they are. We would all do all of them. The question there, of course, is whether any given policy falls in that category. I'm then going to spend a lot of time um, talking about tax issues, partly because I'm overly obsessed with them, partly because it's the only topic I know slightly more than Justin about, so I don't need to embarrass myself, but because I think it's a real laboratory for looking at when growth and inequality conflict, which I think they do a decent amount, how to think about it, and finally, we'll do some concluding speculations. So first, the cross-country growth evidence. This has become increasingly reiterated at policy circles around the world that inequality is bad for economic growth. There's been research on this for the last 20 years. There are dozens and dozens of papers, many of them surveyed um, in a paper that Heather wrote, the OECD, that go through them that have found this conclusion. Not everything has found it. Sometimes you find, um, you know, and recently the IMF, including German, and the OECD have reached this conclusion. You know, you, some of the papers reach a certain amount of nuance. Robert Barrow finds inequality is bad in developing countries and good in advanced economies. A recent paper found the exact opposite, that inequality is, bad in is, is good in developing countries, bad in advanced economies. Some find different things at different time horizons. I did a Jackson Hole paper with Joe Stiglitz in 1998 where we found no relationship. And, um, but on balance, it's sort of a lot more papers that find a negative relationship, and that's what's talked about. To look at the recent um, Austria et al. Um, IMF paper, um, this gives you the Gini and net income. It gives you the line. You know, the first thing you can see here is that um, you know, there's a negative relationship, but to make strong statements like we can only have growth if we bring down inequality or we have low levels of inequality isn't something that you'd want to make off a statement with this much variation. And in fact, if you look at the slope of the line and look at the largest changes in inequality in the United States over a five-year period, they would translate into about two one-hundredths of a percentage point on the growth rate, um, which is sort of a good thing that you reduced inequality, a good thing that you raised growth. But if your sole objective in life was to raise growth, I don't think you'd tell people, you know, go out and do this massive change on inequality. It wouldn't be, that wouldn't be the reason you were doing it on inequality. It might be um, a reason not to not do it. You wonder why people were confused. Um, the OECD looked at regions. They found a negative relationship within Europe, a negative relationship within everything um, that's not Europe. If you pull it all together, um, you didn't see the same negative relationship um, in their data. I want to talk a little bit about the shortcomings of the empirical evidence. And again, my perspective is, as a policymaker who's trying to make policy choices about things that affect inequality and things that affect growth, how do we want to think about the trade-off between these two? How do we want to think about um, the relationship between the two of these? I think there are some empirical questions on the cross-country evidence. I don't want to spend a lot of time on these, but you know, Always with cross-country evidence, you worry about endogeneity, you worry about fewer data points than we have hypotheses we're testing with those data points. Some of the results are fragile. People like Art Cray have raised questions about the weakness of the instruments. Um, I find it perfectly, find it deeply implausible that you could go out and argue that inequality is good for growth based on the cross-country evidence. And I think it, that itself um, is an important contribution, that if you want to reduce inequality, don't worry that that's going to have a negative impact on growth. Don't say um, that's an objection to it. If um, you sort of put a gun to my head, I would say maybe on balance inequality is bad for growth, but I wouldn't say it with a really high level of conviction, certainly not a high enough one that one would want to make any given policy choice or orientation off of it. What I want to spend more time, though, is how policymakers should interpret these regressions. Because these regressions are basically social science. They're trying to understand what inequality does to the economy, which isn't the same as what policymakers are cared about. They care about what their policies will do to the economy. And just to give one example, if we had a huge empirical research program to figure out what's better to have 70% um, of GDP in debt or 70% of GDP in an asset, 
I think we decide that that second country, the one with 70% of GDP and an asset, was better off than the first country, and we'd all rather be the second country than the first country. It would not follow from that that the right answer for the first country is that it should run huge surpluses so it could get itself to a 70% of GDP um, surplus. How that works out in the inequality literature is you look at a whole range of papers from the beginning of this literature to the end, and they'll explain this negative relationship. Um, you see this in Alicina and Roderick, and you see this in a more recent paper, that when there's more inequality, the median um, voter is poorer. The median voter is decisive, and they'll vote for higher capital taxes, which are bad for the economy in their model, or higher levels of transfers, also bad for the economy in their model. And so you'll get a negative relationship between growth and inequality. There are two policy implications if you believe this model. The first is that you'd much rather be a policymaker in a country that's more equal than a policymaker in a country that's less equal. Um, which is a useful social science thing, not a useful thing for policymakers. The second is if you are in a country that's very unequal, you don't want to try to reduce that inequality because it'll be inefficient um, to do so. I'm not endorsing this model. I find an alternative model, which you could say is in the spirit of Isamoglu, Johnson, Robinson, other research, that higher inequality strengthens the power of the elites, leading them to you know, underfund education for the poor, steal rents, do whatever else they do. Um, and that less education leads to lower growth. I find that an equally plausible interpretation of the data. My point is just that just because you see inequality hurting growth doesn't mean anything about distinguishing between these two hypotheses. You'd need to look at what inequality does to education funding or capital taxation. You'd need to look at what capital taxation or education does for growth you can't just infer from a negative relationship in the reduced form something that's relevant for policymakers. The other conceptual point is that um, the left-hand side variable of growth is not what policymakers actually say that they care about. Now, they talk about the middle class, they talk about you know, the median typical household, sometimes they talk about the poor. Very rarely would a policymaker say something is going to make a billionaire's income go up everyone else is going to go down, but on average, it'll average out to a higher growth rate. Um, needless to say, as we all know, um, you can look at growth rates across countries. The United States was the highest of the G7. And you can look at a lot of other measures that I won't talk about. I just circled one of them. Um, oh, I meant to circle two, sorry. I wasn't trying to just look at the bottom quintile. But if you look at the bottom or the median, the United States, instead of being at the top of the G7 over the last 20 years, is towards the middle, uh, is towards the bottom of the G7 um, over the last 20 years. And so even if you had a robust answer to inequality and growth, in some sense, that's not what you care about. You care about the effect of policies on the middle or the bottom 90% or an Atkinson index with whatever your inequality aversion parameter is. Or if you're Justin, you care about mean log GDP um, per capita. And you're going to get different answers in those questions. So now switching to what you know, is relevant for policymakers is when you figure out that all good things go together, you should sort of rush to do those sorts of policies. The last decade's worth of research and the last couple of years' worth of speculation have widened the possible area for policymaking of that type. I want to give a brief sample of some of that. There's been a lot of recent micro research that has taken advantage of administrative data to follow people over longer periods of time than we followed them in previous research and look at the impact of programs like Head Start or housing vouchers on what people's income is 10, 20 years in the future or what their health status is, mortality, college completion, a set of things like that. And in general, this research is coming up with a resounding answer that more money for households with poor children, whether that's in the form of education, Medicaid, housing vouchers, um, there's research on the EITC I left off of this list, um, seems to be associated with higher earnings, more robustly for women, to some degree with men, and a bunch of other outcomes um, that are better. 
That would suggest that, in, and then there's a, um, another strand of research that insofar as you have work disincentive effects for a lot of these programs, they're more income effects than substitution effects, um, which is not something that as policymakers we, we should worry about from a, from a welfare perspective. This suggests this whole area might be um, a reasonably plausible area where all good things go together. Um, the second area, um, um, and here I'm sort of using the word plausible deliberately, um, there's been a lot of interest, including for myself in the last couple of years, about policies that increase competition and reduce rents could also help from both a micro and macro perspective. Um, it could be that increased levels of concentration are reducing business investment and through inter-industry wage differentials leading to different returns in different industries and raising inequality. And the response to that, and you know, happy to talk about any more of this in the Q&A, could be more conventional antitrust or could be other things that reduce barriers to entry, increase mobility, less restrictive property rights, um, et cetera. So I do think the possibility that there's a wider space of policies that help both is quite plausible. Um, I myself, though, don't want to confine myself to those policies because I don't want to contort myself into thinking that everything I like is good on every dimension. I think a lot of things in economics do have trade-offs, and a lot of what we need to do is evaluate those trade-offs. And that's where I want to get to with this um, public finance example. And I'm going to start um, with a very um, stylized example from tax policy and then try to talk about how general this is or isn't. And the stylized setting is going to be that we have a 25% tax rate on all labor income and we come along and cut the labor tax rate from 25% to 22.5%. And we pay for that with a $900 lump sum tax and net of the dynamic effects, which pay for about 12% of the cost um, in this model. And this is a Ramsey model that follows, um, follows a Menke Wines rule paper. You do the analysis of this model in a representative agent setting, and you find that incomes are 1% higher, taxes are unchanged, and you come to the earth-shattering conclusion that 100% of the representative agents in your model are better off. And you know that sounds like it's not like the most exciting finding um, ever, but there's a whole um, Journal of Public Economics paper uh, by Mankiw and Weinzerl that sort of exudes a lot of enthusiasm for this form of tax reform because it increases growth, it raises incomes, it makes people um, better off, and it, it basically analyzes something a lot like that. What I did is went back and looked at that, except using, instead of everyone having the same income, the actual income distribution in the year 2010. And what you see is that 96% of households do see an increase in their before-tax income. But two-thirds of households get a tax increase because the lump sum tax was larger for them than the rate reduction was. As a result, 46% of households see an increase in their after-tax income. But if you take into account that all these, this extra income came from working harder, working is um, you know, viewed as a negative, and so you want to subtract the cost of the foregone leisure, it turns out 41% of households are better off. That doesn't tell you whether we should do this policy or shouldn't do this policy. To me, it tells me that we need to look really, you can't look at the aggregate statement when the whole way that growth was generated was as a result of a very large distributional change um, in the tax code. Ideally, you'd look at all of these together. We could spend a bunch of time um, doing that, which I won't do now. But what I want to um, try to convince you is that this example where the tax changes themselves, the distributional static naive sort of communist approach to, to making tax policy just by looking at distribution tables is going to by itself get you a lot closer to the right answer than thinking about growth. Um, this table is sort of as many largely official sector um, plus one non-official sector done, uh, done by Alan Auerbach and co-authors estimates of the growth effects of different tax plans. 
And just to focus on the bottom one, this is a switching to a flat tax with transition relief. This is about as sort of pure and great a tax reform as one could possibly imagine. And over a one decade horizon, it raises growth by half a point. Over 150 years, it raises it by 1.9 points. And anything you could possibly imagine coming out of Congress would be so level, 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 level. Absolutely. 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 Yes, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Yes, these are these are all levels. Um, and you know, this is sort of thinking of what comes out of Congress. You'd imagine you'd be sort of lucky to get something one quarter as thoughtful and well designed as that. Moreover, these aren't welfare. Part of why you're getting the higher levels of output are people are working harder, which is a minus. People are saving more, which is a minus. And in some of these cases, I think this one is national income, in some of these you're actually looking at gross domestic product, and part of how you're getting that gross domestic product is by borrowing more from abroad, so you're not actually raising your national income because you're gonna have to devote that GDP in the future to um, repaying it. In contrast to these numbers, which are all quite small, I'm just gonna show you, this is all the tax changes from 1986 to 2013, they had really large impacts on income. They raised the income of the bottom quintile by 7%. Um, these are level effects too, of course. Um, lowered it for the top 1% by minus 12%. This is a lot of different laws combined together, but if you look just at the unified framework for tax reform put out two weeks ago, you'd see numbers of a similar magnitude to this. The signs are a little bit different. Um, <laughs> if you look at the Affordable Care Act, you look at the 2010 Recovery Act, you look at a lot of pieces of tax legislation, numbers of the 10 and 20% change in after-tax income are relatively common. These also are, for the most part, can be thought of as welfare, because you don't have to work harder to get this, you don't have to save more, you just sort of can just sit there and keep doing what you're doing um, and get this. So to some degree, I look at this and think this is directly observable and measurable and as a Bayesian believe it. I look at the previous set of stuff and don't 100% um, believe it and then I weigh the two together and say if all you're doing is the naive looking at this, you're not doing the exactly right thing but within the range of the types of tax policies and transfer policies at least where we can quantify this, you're not gonna go far wrong either. I would add, and now I'm switching to growth rates, Larry, not levels, um, that a lot of policies have this character. I won't talk a lot about these, but I tried to use um, independent estimates of different parameters to quantify the best possible version of everything President Trump has proposed and the worst possible version of everything President Trump has proposed. So on immigration, that's cutting immigration in half. On tariffs, that's the Peterson estimate of a 45% tariff on China, 35% on Mexico. On the other side, that's like a really well-designed business tax reform as opposed to the actual one that was proposed. Um, and you get numbers on growth rates that tend to be in the tenths. Most of those, again, are rather extreme versions of those different policies. So an awful lot of the macro policies that we're worried about in growth in mature advanced economies have this character that the changes they have are second order relative to the distribution ones where at least we can estimate them. So finally, for some concluding um, speculations about all of this, um, what I just said is for the types of policies we generally consider in mature advanced economies, and if you look at high income economies, there's not a whole lot of difference in growth rates at the 75th percentile, growth rates are half a point higher than they are at the 25th percentile. For low and middle income economies, there's enormous variations in um, growth rates. And you look at you know, a country like China, which has seen a big increase in inequality, has also seen a massive increase in growth and lifted 700 million people out of poverty. So how one wants to think about balancing these two considerations in that context might be quite different. Um, I would say in an advanced economy, having, and, and this is, um, Anyway, uh, this is where I think I lost Larry. Um, taking a lexicographic approach to balancing distribution and growth. Um, if policies have different distribution, just use the distribution. 
That doesn't say actually pick the more progressive one. That might say you think the rich are overtaxed and that it's unfair for anyone to pay more than they're paying, that the state tax is double taxation, that you should be taxing based on what you have. All of those arguments are completely fair game under this lexicographic. It just says don't do a lot of hand waving about the impact on growth. Defend the distribution table in a naive fairness type of way. Um, the second is where there's little reason to believe a policy affects distribution, then focus on maximizing growth or more appropriately welfare. And there's a ton of things in that category and each one of them is probably half of a tenth on growth and we do five of them and we'll get two and a half tenths on growth and over time that would matter, um, matter a lot and so I'm, I'm very much for that. For developing countries, I think it's more nuanced that different policies would be evaluated differently and in general, a bias towards growth might actually be the right orientation because over time, that'll cure and overcome a lot of these distributional ones. And then finally, as we think the macroeconomics of inequality and growth, less macro and more micro, um, less on whether inequality is good and bad for growth, more on policies on inequality and whether they're good or bad for growth. And then I think, and this is happening in research, but a lot more thinking about what we want to have on the left-hand side different measures of welfare, median income, you know, from transparent ones like median income to complicated ones like the OECD's multidimensional um, living standards and understanding how those perform in different settings. Thank you. Um, as I said, I am a paltry replacement for Donny Roderick in every sense, but his views are so important on these issues, and he's so directly engaged in his comments with, um, with Jason's excellent presentation that I wanted to make sure they at least got hearing. So concentrate very much on the screen, not on the person vocalizing what's on the screen. Um, down, not up. Woohoo! All right, seriously. So, Professor Roderick makes a few observations about claims that he believes Jason is making in his paper. First, that cross country inequality growth regressions are not very helpful for policy, as Jason argued. And then he goes in and tries to say, well, there's a lot of ways to think about it. How do we think about social welfare? And, and what is the actual policy? and rightly points out the distinction between the social scientist and the policy analyst. But of course, this goes to the fundamental start of the conference that Olivier and Larry raised, which is we're trying to fix macro policy in real time at the same time we're trying to do social science. Um, and so the question is, when you're looking at these cross-national regressions, is the social scientist trying to look at exogenous variation? And as Danny points out, if we know what the exogenous variation is, then there's obviously, we're assuming less room for the agency by the policymaker. But does that mean that it's useless? Betty be not, and of course Jason said this, but it's great to have Danny emphasize it. There was a wildly held, widely held view going back decades that inequality was actually desirable for growth, particularly in the early development stages. Political scientists like Samuel Huntington talking about Korea in the 50s, among others. Um, and so it is very important, I think Jason agrees with this, that we may, the, if, the, if the evidence does anything, it seems to kill that idea. Um, Jason is said to have made a second claim that the growth effects of actual policies, such as tax changes, are much smaller than the redistributive effects. And um, as Larry was pointing out in a specific example, what Jason's actually talking about in the paper are the level of steady state output. This is not ongoing, these tax changes, this is not ongoing growth year after year. So it's a question of averaging it over the years. Um, but essentially, now we're getting into numbers and public finance, so I'm really just gonna read. Um, follows the fact that distributive effects are rectangles and the efficiency gains are triangles. You know, this is sort of the, the basic flaw of this. If you're transferring rents, the chart will go up in a second, or maybe it's already up. So you've got a tax wedge, and 
if you see here, you can, if you change the tax wedge at a different point on the tax schedule, you're going to get different size effects. Those are those triangles. And this is the rectangle you get in between, and that will vary over time. But the redistribution essentially is the same when you're just directly transferring from people to people. So at, what Danny would argue is that as a matter of theory, the redistribution may not change, but the tax change or the other policy instrument change gets bigger, excuse me, gets smaller as you get down to low levels. And of course, Danny has in mind reducing tariffs, for example, when you're already at very low levels of tariffs. And he talks about that with context to NAFTA. But as many people point out, there are also one hopes um, and some evidence for dynamic growth effects as well. So we have to take those into account. So this is Danny going through this in the case of trade. I apologize, I'm gonna skip this slide I, because I don't know what's in the black box that gave those numbers. I'm sure it's right, but I'm not gonna talk about something where I don't know where the numbers came from. Um, so Danny points out that if you look at NAFTA, for example, the actual level effects in terms of income are relatively small, even when you're doing big things. Now, I, we have a lot of work here that might suggest otherwise, but let's leave that aside for the moment. Um, but so then what about the real growth effects? What about the idea that by making changes, whether it's dynamic changes to the tax code, or I mean tax, changes to the tax code that will have dynamic effects on the economy, or trade competition opening that would have dynamic effects on the economy, dynamic meaning raising the growth rate on an ongoing basis. So many people, I would be one, would suggest these kinds of studies underestimate the dynamic effect of trade agreements. And so Danny, of course, acknowledges and has been a contributor to the new growth theory that policy can affect long-run growth. We discussed yesterday in the opening session with Larry and Olivier. We discussed in the fiscal section some of the pluses and minuses. Valerie Ramey gave some reasons to be skeptical about the virtues of public investment. Others made a strong case for it. But, and this goes into issues of monopoly profits and externalities, which goes to some of Jason's agenda of policies that are good on both fronts, inequality and growth, that if you're promoting competition, if you're dealing with this, there are dynamic effects, or at least there should be. But as in keeping with many of the things Danny has written about political economy through the years, there are very situation-specific stories, very situation-specific effects. So if you build a endogenous growth model, you don't automatically assume, but you basically push towards saying level effects must be coming through, at least in part, a dynamic channel, an ongoing growth channel. But they also can generate second best perverse of X. And so as often as the case in public finance, he shows how or at least asserts how taxes or tariffs, which presumably, in his view, are, are direct, have large redistributive effects, might not have such bad growth effects or might have equally big growth effects. So then turning, as he should, to the issue of developing economies, and of course, much of what Jason said was applicable, but we have to break this out somewhat. Developing economies should place comparatively more weight on growth because growth rate differentials are much larger. Uh, that would be what Jason argued, uh, according to Danny. But what matters is the portion of the variation is exploitable by policy, and it's not, and Danny argues or asserts that it's not clear we have greater leverage there except in the extremes of bad policy. Again, this is an interesting statement. It's somewhat contentious. I'm very glad we'll be having Deputy Prime Minister Shagun Ratnam telling us about this in a different view, though he's not a developing country. Um, we also know very little, Danny asserts, between the actual policy and long-run growth, even in developing countries. Again, there are going to be literature references in the paper from Danny for you to check out that claim, and I, I will leave it at that. Um, but I think one of the most important points Danny makes is this idea of the larger distortions tax otherwise do imply less redistribution per output gain. This is an interesting theory point, and it's very interesting if one takes the the mindset that, that may not be applicable in today's America, but the idea that less developed countries have less corruption and, distor and, and more distortions of obvious market interference. And so therefore that ratio of rectangle to rectangle, rectangle to triangle is good. So that does say that maybe we have to think differently about the trade-off of going directly after changes through tax code or trade code in terms of redistribution in developing countries. <laughs> 
Um, so concluding, again, channeling Danny, um, he broadly agrees with Jason's paper and sympathizes with its aims. The redistributive effects of tax and trade policies seem to be large and are more predictable ex ante. And, I, and the more predictable, I think, is also a very important point, that I, doing these dynamic models of taxes like Jason and many people are doing right now for the US is one thing, but we know that certain redistributions of who pays taxes are much easier to predict. Um, the ratio and therefore the welfare gains are particularly important when the trade or tax distortions are small. And it's important to be clear about the difference between level and steady state effects versus long run growth effects. Obviously, compounding long run growth is much more important, but Danny was assessment of the literature and the evidence as we understand them a lot less well. It still would encourage, even with the cautions about agency coming out of the cross-national growth regressions, that we don't want to give up getting a grip on how policy affects long-run growth. Again, I commend to you Danny's outline, and we will be publishing the paper in the volume. Darman. Thanks, Adam. Uh, first, uh, uh, I must say Jason has written a very good paper. Uh, the best papers in this field uh, are, are the boring ones. Uh, that's my working rule. And you've come up with um, conclusions on the relationship between inequality and growth, which are boring and correct. Uh, the simple fact is that the headline stories on the um, empirical relationships between the two are overstated. And second, as you've pointed out quite well, the uh, hypotheses are misspecified both on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. Uh, we should be looking on the right-hand side at the implications or the Im impactfulness of policies that aim to raise social welfare. And we should be looking at the left-hand side in terms of what our real objective is, uh, not at simple aggregates of GDP per capita, growth or levels, uh, but about its distribution or about its broad-based nature. So some normative measure of social welfare is the way to think about it. It happens to be the way in which uh, policymakers tend to think about it formally or informally, or consciously or unconsciously. Uh, and I think it's also the way in which most ordinary people think about it. Uh, most ordinary people don't understand something invented by an Italian statistician called Gini. Uh, but they do understand something about whether their lives are improving over time uh, whether daughters and sons are doing better than mothers and fathers. Uh, they do understand whether opportunities uh, are more equal or less equal within their own cohorts um, to do as well as possible in life. And as a generalization, I would say people uh, attach a lot of significance to absolute mobility and absolute movement of incomes and absolute movements of social welfare. When the absolute movements are dulled or diminished, the relativities become more important. And I say this as a stylized uh, fact of social psychology. When absolute income growth is dull and diminished or stagnant, um, relativities become more important. And in that regard, it's not just the relativities uh, as we normally conceive of, uh, of it. It's not simply about the middle class being concerned about the gap between the middle and the, and the top. It's actually up and down that ladder. Um, everyone enjoys the spectacle of someone at the top of the totem pole sliding down. Um, but most people uh, in the middle class don't particularly enjoy the, the fact of someone who is below them moving up and displacing them. And that is one of the great uh, challenges of social policy, that we want to have a fluidity in our societies. But that fluidity is best accepted, embraced, and celebrated when there's absolute improvements for everyone or for the majority of people. And I say this uh, in a very broad sense, but it accords not just with the way in which I think policymakers should think about the issue, uh, but also the way in which most ordinary people think about the issue. So if you think about absolute, uh, about broad-based growth, 
and you know, if I think of the all good things go together quadrant in Jason's paper, um, it's basically about broad-based growth, or what we simply call inclusive growth. You have to think hard about median incomes, think hard, hard about the bottom quartile of incomes, and think of it both in terms of individual workers as well as households. And the household is a very important site uh, for social welfare improvements. We're not doing well on most of those scores. Uh, we're not doing well in much of the advanced world, and we are not doing well in a significant part of the emerging and developing country world. We know the basic story in the advanced world, and it's uh, well told when it comes to the uh, more readily uh, uh, available data on you know, medium household incomes, what's happened in the last two decades or last three decades, not just in the United States, but in a whole range of societies. What's uh, uh, even more uh, troubling uh, is the longer run longitudinal data um, on how daughters and sons are doing relative to their parents. Uh, and there the work by Raj Shetty and his um, compatriots and some other pieces of work uh, tell a, a remarkable story of the stalling of mobility from one generation to the next. The data is best in the United States, and we know it only impressionistically in a range of other countries, but it's there. And um, for those who are not familiar with it, it, it tells us that um, if you look at the cohort of uh, people who are in their early 30s today, in other words, they were born in the early 1980s, um, only half of them are earning uh, more equal or more than what their parents did. This was looking at sons and fathers. That's where the data was best for some reason. I guess female labor force participation was much weaker in the older days. So looking at sons and fathers in their early 30s, only 50% of sons are earning more than their father, fathers, which is a remarkable stalling of income mobility from one generation to the next. And in the Rust Belt, it's well below 50%. In other words, something like 40% or just slightly upwards of 40% of young men in their 30s are earning more than their fathers did. And that's a remarkable change in narrative. And it is perceived, it's felt, it is known. And when you, when you combine that with a stylized sociological fact, or I should say stylized fact from social psychology, that most people uh, tend to uh, form the expectations of where they'd like to be and how well they'd like to do it and, uh, based on an extrapolation from the past. Uh, and when you extrapolate from the past and you find that your expectations based on that extrapolation of past trends isn't realized, it leads to great disappointment. Uh, that's a stylized fact in social psychology. And what we are seeing today is that combination of extrapolations from the past that hasn't materialized, and it's leading to great disappointment. That's in the advanced economies. A, a second very troubling story is the persistent lack of convergence uh, from developing to, uh, amongst developing countries relative to the advance for a significant group of developing countries. The, the, the simple logic of convergence, that if you start off from below, you can borrow technologies, existing best practices, and catch up, uh, has worked out for some countries, particularly a, a fair number of countries in East Asia, but it hasn't worked out for a very large number of other developing countries. And I was just looking last night at the latest IMF uh, WIO, uh, World Economic Outlook, which had a very good chapter on, on uh, convergence and looking at... Uh, uh, 2017 to 2022, and it continues a trend seen in the past, which is countries which were converging are going to continue to converge, and countries which weren't converging uh, continue not to converge. So something is happening there. With the same exposure to a global economy, with the same availability of technologies and existing best practices, some countries are converging and other countries aren't and we have to understand why. The simple conclusion uh, coming out of Jason's paper, coming out of some other papers, is that with the same ex global economy and the same set of technologies, uh, 
there's wide variation in countries of income growth as well as broad-based income growth. There's very wide variation, and it suggests very simply that domestic policies and domestic institutions uh, explain a great deal of what happens in life. Domestic policies explain a great deal of the, the divergences that we are seeing. At each level of income, you've got a divergence in income growth and in broad-based income growth. And we've got to try and delve into what those differences are in domestic policies. And I'll talk very briefly uh, about uh, three dimensions of this uh, that apply uh, variously to the advanced economies and to the developing economies. First, we know from the work that Jason uh, and several others have been uh, doing, including people at the ECB and the OECD, that we are getting a puzzling divergence in productivity growth uh, between firms that are close to the frontier and those that are not at the frontier. Again, there, the catch-up and convergence hasn't been happening. And for reasons we don't fully understand, there has been a slowdown in the pace of technological diffusion. And this is not just of interest from the point of view of technology. It's of great interest from the point of view of wage inequalities, uh, because studies by Jason and others have found that a good part of wage inequality is really inequality for the same job between different firms uh, rather than in inequality within the firm across different jobs. What can we do to speed up learning and technological diffusion within each industry and within an economy? That has to be a central challenge in public policy. And it's a challenge not just from the point of view of economic outcomes, it's also a challenge from the point of view of the spread of incomes and the social, social uh, inclusiveness that comes with that. And I think there are, there, again, lessons from around the world. Some countries are doing it better than others. And it's not just culture and philosophy. It's also mechanisms and institutions. Uh, if you look at Germany, for instance, you know, well-known example. But if you study how they actually do it, uh, they're interesting institutions that help smaller firms to catch on to the latest technologies. And they do it in a fairly customized way. The story of the Fraunhofer's, uh, Fraunhofer is well known, bringing R&D down to the, the, the production floor in smaller firms and medium-sized firms. There's also the less well-known story of the um, Steinbeis, um, which is a fascinating institution with several thousand experts being deployed in a very un-Germanic way, in a very chaotic way, uh, to a whole mass of SMEs. And it's a, market, it's a market system, a chaotic market system that matches experts to small enterprises for a year, sometimes for two years, um, with a commission and a, and a remuneration attached to it. But we need more of those intermediaries. We need more intermediaries to help markets work better and help spread new technologies and existing technologies too more quickly uh, across an industry and across a cluster. That's the first area, micro policy if you like, but with macro outcomes and macro social outcomes. Second very important area has to do with place. And we all know how important it is. It shouldn't have taken uh, uh, electoral results to tell us how important it is, but that's very interesting because if you look at the, whether it's Brexit or the latest uh, U.S. elections, or if you look at Turkey, or if you look at France, uh, there's a fascinating divergence in voting patterns between city, suburbs, small towns, and rural areas. A remarkable uh, regularity, in fact. Uh, and it does happen to match the way in which uh, many places have been left behind while others have moved ahead. And we know from economics that that is entirely to be expected, uh, and it's not just about globalization, it's also globalization plus agglomeration economies, which accentuate the impact of globalization. Um, the emerging narrative of compensating the losers is, I think, uh, most inadequate uh, and also misplaced, both politically as well as in terms of what the new dynamic or new positive spirals that we want to see. Compensating the losers is a terrible phrase, in fact. Uh, we need a far more activist social ambition 
in government. An activist social ambition that can enable globalization, technological disruption, and agglomeration economies to work well for more towns and more places. And it doesn't happen in the marketplace. It doesn't happen naturally in the market. The natural workings of the market don't lead to this, either the economic market or, or the way in which um, people behave. And it can be done because we notice some places do it better than others. Uh, even if you look within the United States, there are, in truth, two Rust Belts. Uh, if you look at what's happening in Milwaukee or Minneapolis or Pittsburgh, it's a very different Rust Belt story compared to the, the towns and cities that are still stuck in slack and are seeing some sort of, um, if I can call it, a social hysteresis uh, at play where they are in a negative spiral. But there are some towns and cities that have gone through a positive spiral, and we've got to understand why. It's the same story in a whole range of other countries. Uh, Germany, you know, why are the, the towns around the Stuttgart area, in Baden-Württemberg, doing persistently well? Why are those in the Ruhr Valley doing persistently badly? Uh, France, likewise, you know, why is Lorraine stuck and stag in, in stagnation? Italy, why is um, Mezzogiorno? stuck in the same place for so long, while the area in, around Milan is, is doing persistently well. Why do divergences persist whilst exposed to the same global economy, the same, set of techno same technology set? It has something to do with local policy. And it has something to do in particular, uh, and I'm, this takes me to my third point, which has to do with creating communities of learning. And I say communities of learning, because there's something in a local social compact that motivates people, creates a sense of mutual obligation, and that binds business leaders, community leaders, local mayors or uh, political leaders, and ordinary people. It's very hard to achieve it. I mean, you can do it in Singapore because it's a small country, but you can't do it on a continental scale, you can't even do it on a normal national scale, it works best and it works well at a city level, when people more or less know each other and they form social bonds, not just economic uh, obligations with each other. So, which means, moves me to my final point, which is when we think of communities and learning, of learning, uh, I think it requires quite a fundamental rethink of the way higher education is proceeding. Uh, and I say this both from the point of view of national policies as well as developing these communities of learning and practice. Um, higher education is, has become a hugely inefficient uh, area of human activity or industry, if you like. Uh, the data speaks for itself. Uh, if you look at the United States, and I, you know, there's data elsewhere as well, but as usual, the data is, for one reason or another, much better in the U.S. Um, one out of two college students in the U.S. don't graduate after five years. A little higher in the case of public universities, but even for private universities, it's less than 60% who graduate after five years. Uh, and the typical cost of a college education, by the way, is not four years. It's five years or more. Expensive and with very weak outcomes. Uh, if you look at um, what happens for those who do graduate, 40% of them are not working in jobs that require a college degree. So huge inefficiency. And I say this not just in terms of economic inefficiency, but inefficiency in, in achieving personal goals. And, and developing people to, the, to their mostest. Look at India, look at China, look at Korea, look at Taiwan. Very significant underemployment of college grads. Now, this is not an argument to stop people from going to college. A higher education is now a prerequisite for doing well in a technology-enriched world. But it is an argument for rethinking the form of higher education. And we've trundled into an over-academized over form of higher education that doesn't match the demands of the real world and doesn't match 
the distribution of human abilities and learning styles that exist in every, every population. The stock answer to that is to say, well, but the regular four-year college, whether it's a liberal arts education or the, the regular academic, academically oriented uh, college education, uh, does a better job at breeding some generic skills, the soft skills, the creativity, and um, uh, critical thinking skills. And I think there's a lot of elitism that's built into that proposition. We should not assume that the applied model of education, the model of education that involves doing and thinking at the same time, is bereft of the development of generic skills. In fact, it develops soft skills, to my mind, to a greater extent than a regular academic education does. And that applies to team skills, to cross-cultural skills, as well as to creative skills. So there are different types of generic skills that we need to develop. We have skewed our systems far too much towards an academic orientation. It is hugely inefficient, and it doesn't match the needs of even the generic, it doesn't even produce the generic skills required for a constantly changing world. It's not too late to change. There's, in fact, interesting talk now taking place in the UK where they've converted all their polytechnics to universities about trying to rediscover uh, the uh, applied or dual form of education. There are good examples in uh, Northern Europe as to how it's done. Some others, like Singapore, are uh, doing the same thing and moving in the same direction. There's some extremely good community colleges in the United States. Not very far from here, for instance, you've got Nova in Northern Virginia. Extremely good community college, community of learning and practice, tied up with businesses, students having time in the businesses and time in, in the lecture halls or tutorial rooms, and feeling more confident about their futures. So we've got to do a pretty fundamental rethink there. We've moved towards too much academization of higher education, and we have front-loaded knowledge education into the first 20 or 22 years of a person's life. And the, the new game has to be one of doing and thinking as you learn, not just thinking, and doing and thinking through your life. And that whole game of lifelong education, learning through life, is a very exciting and very important social and economic strategy for the future. It happens to be the most important strategy in Singapore. We call it skills future. But it's a critical strategy for the future. It's more equitable, it's more efficient, and I think it'll allow us to cope with a technology-rich world in a way that's less defensive and far more positive. So I'd like to end there. Uh, I think uh, Jason's uh, papers stimulated a lot of thinking. Think about the micro, think about social welfare, not just simple aggregate statistics, and think about actual strategies that work and borrow lessons from the places where it is working, including places within the United States itself and places around the world. Thank you. I, I normally don't interrupt the flow, and we're about to have Justin Wolf first, but I, I have to take a moment, partly because I left my phone up here, but um, the, main, the main reason is simply to say um, there are a lot of rock stars in the international economic policy sphere. We have a few of them running this conference, but I can think of no one who combines substantive content, political awareness, forceful vision, ability to articulate it, global view, like Tharman Shagunaratnam. And I'm very proud to say that he has accepted the biggest honor we at the Institute can give to give the Niarchos, Starbos Niarchos annual lecture at the Institute this May, following Larry, Mervyn King, and many other distinguished people. But we're just so looking forward to that. And thank you for being here with us today, Tharman. So I'm going to uh, move the focus back to Jason's paper um, and maybe even commit the sin that was just described as excessive academization. Um, um, I, I found Jason's paper to be characteristically thoughtful and um, it also revealed that he's left government because it was also provocative. Um, 
and it shows, um, you know, he, he begins with a, an assessment of the evidence on the relationship with between um, growth and inequality. It's a, it's a literature I've looked at very closely too, and I have no quibble whatsoever with his characterization of that. Um, you know, he sort of says it's hard to know. Um, that seems right. Um, one of the things he didn't note, perhaps it was too polite to note, was actually when you're reading this literature, a sufficient statistic for figuring out um, the, the bottom line of any individual study is knowing the political leanings of the author. Um, when you have a literature that's like that, that then suggests that the degree of actual uncertainty about the underlying parameters is probably even larger than we thought before. Um, so I think when Jason says it's hard to know, but I sort of think I know, I'd sort of stop it, it's hard to know. Um, he then goes on to talk somewhat about the shortcomings of the empirical evidence. Um, and this is where there's a very difficult empirical balancing act here, which is if you say it's hard to know, in econometric terms you're saying there's not enough variance in inequality for us to come up with any sharp answers. And then he says, but I don't want to look at all the variance. I only want to look at the variance in inequality that is caused by policy shifts. So it was already hard to know when you're looking at all the, all the experiments. And then he wants to sort of throw three quarters of them out and only look at the variation in inequality that's caused by policymakers. And so, you know, if you want to um, think about this in technical terms, we face a, a bias efficiency trade-off. Um, and so sometimes... Uh, we, we pretend to be Cambridge-trained labour economists and we're absolutely sharp about looking only for the pure causal explanations and sometimes the world's much messier and we have to take the data that's out there. Um, so uh, there's a sense in which, you know, the, the Rumsfeld rule applies here. You go to war with the data you have, not the data you want. Um, and Jason's critique of the literature is one that I think sort of um, wishes the Rumsfeld uh, rule wasn't there. Um, but uh, the other, the other um, critique that he makes is, of course, that the growth literature is focused on growth and we care about other things, um, much as was just articulated. Um, and that's obviously right. And so he suggests, in fact, that more research should focus on developing and analysing left-hand side variables that are normatively relevant. And here he thinks about things like median income, the income of the poor, the bottom quintile, or, or the mean of log income. And so this is one of those statements that seems absolutely correct, um, but I wonder how much it actually matters. So I actually went and looked at the world distribution of income through each of these different lenses instead. So here I'm showing you, I've, I've got every country in the world, the horizontal axis shows real GDP per capita. That's the, the focus of the existing growth literature. And Jason says, no, no, that's not normatively um, informative, let's look at median income instead. Now, I don't actually have median income, I've got the average income of the median quintile. Um, but as you can see, you wouldn't miss much of the action if you were focused on growth rather than median income. Now, to be fair to Jason, he says, let's focus on the rich countries, not the poor countries. So I've highlighted the OECD countries in blue so you can see what the rich countries are. The other way you can see what the rich countries are is they're the ones at the right. Um, <laughs> But again, you know, if this liter any literature that's been trying to explain what's going on with growth probably is going to do a pretty good job explaining what's going on with median incomes. Jason says instead, well, what about, you know, um, as a, as a, as a um, good lefty, we should really care about the poor. So let's have a look at the poor. Um, so we can repeat the same thing, same exercise, and this time look at the income of the poorest fifth of the population. Um, so... Not everything's on the 45 degree line here. Some things are a little bit off. So some of the variance of the well-being of the poor across countries is due to differences in income shares, but still really not very much. Um, and so when we think about policies that tend to be good for growth, it looks like, or policies, institutions, country differences, it looks like they're the same things on the whole that are also good for the poor. Um, now, these are two very simple statistics. You could think about, well, what does social welfare look like? How far astray do we go by looking at GDP rather than social welfare? So you have to take a stance on social welfare. I'm going to take the simplest stance. Um, I think people have log utility. Maybe you have a more complicated one, but my math is simpler than yours as a result. Um, but, you know, this seems like it might be right. So if people have uh, uh, log utility, then what you care about in a country is the average utility. And that, that average utility is going to be equal to, to be clear, the average of log income, which is a different creature than the log of average income. 
Most of the growth literature looks at the log of average income. This says you should care about the average of log income. So then I'm going to perform a complicated mathematical trick known as addition and subtraction and rewrite this. Um, average utility in a country will be equal to log of GDP per capita less the difference between the average of log income and the log of average income. That second term is a well-known measure of income inequality. It's called the mean log deviation. And so we can now, uh, if I have data on all of this, then I could tell you social welfare by country. Well, I sort of do. I have to do one more thing, which is I don't actually know the mean log deviation by country, but the World Bank publishes the Gini coefficient. If incomes are log normally distributed, then the Gini coefficient um, there's a, an approximate mapping between the Gini coefficient and the mean log deviation. And so now what I can do is I can actually take World Bank data and calculate a, a utilitarian measure of social welfare uh, for each of these countries um, and see what that looks like relative to GDP. Right? And again, the basic intuition is social welfare here equals average, uh, equals log GDP per capita less an inequality adjustment. So we want to make that inequality adjustment. When we do that, we actually get an extraordinarily high coefficient. So to the extent that any of these countries lie off the 45 degree line, that's the contribution of inequality to lowering social welfare. Um, and as you can see, they all lie, lie pretty close, which is to say most of the differences across countries in social welfare are driven by differences in GDP per capita, not differences in income inequality. Um, now, this is actually a game you can keep playing, and I played in other literatures. You know, uh, what you do, another, another thing people like to do is you get a bunch of policymakers in a room and you say come up with, you know, a better metric. And so, uh, you know, this is the Human Development Index at the UN. They came up with that. It's correlated with GDP per capita about 0.99. Um, other people work on things like happiness. I've worked on that. That is something that we think should be shaped by income inequality. Its correlation with GDP per capita is about 0.8, um, somewhat lower, but there are bigger measurement problems there. Um, and so time and time again, I think if you, I, I come to the conclusion that if, if, you, if, if you look at GDP per capita, you'd say stuff like, you know, be more like the US, be more like Canada, um, be really like Luxembourg. Um, and if you looked at other richer data that also took account of the, the impact of inequality on well-being, you'd still say exactly the same thing. So the policy conclusions don't much change. So um, this is, I think, the statement where that probably led Larry to call Jason a communist, um, in which he says, an advanced economy is a lexicographic framework that focuses ex exclusively on distributional analysis. So if you only care about distribution, and then after that, think about growth, um, is generally likely to be appropriate. Um, that's a very strong claim to make. Um, so I try to do some thinking about this. Um, again, I'm going to go back to. Uh, log utility land, because that's where I come from. Um, and if you're a utilitarian social welfare uh, planner, then what you're going to want to do is maximize the discounted flow of future log utilities for uh, everyone. Income grows at some rate for everyone. And you're going to get the bottom line here is that uh, welfare is going to depend, the, the forward looking welfare obviously depends on the, the, the economy's growth rate, it depends on its starting conditions, and it depends on inequality. And so the effect of inequality, by the way, it doesn't grow through time. Because if everyone's incomes grow at a constant rate, the utility loss from that remains constant. Um, and so what this allows us to do, we could actually draw indifference curves about how a, policy a utilitarian policymaker thinks about inequality versus growth. I didn't do that here. What I did instead was just thought about a very simple thought experiment, which is take this and say, um, what would we pay? in order to move from the US level of inequality to the Swedish level of inequality. And you can think about this as the flip side of this, which is what would the Swedes be, how much inequality would the Swedes be willing to put up with? Um, and so it turns out the answer here, the trade-off between inequality and growth is in order to move from being the US to having a Swedish level of inequality, we should be comfortable raised, lowering our growth rate from 1.4% per capita to 0.7%. So that seems pretty. That seems like a, a pretty sharp trade-off. Or alternate. So that's when you're thinking about policies that affect growth. When you think about policies that affect levels, then we should be willing to allow the. Instead, you'd be willing to allow the level of GDP to decline by 15 uh, percentage points. And so this is where you sort of come back to um, 
the list of policies that Jason was talking about before. So there are some policies out there that would add, say, two-tenths to the growth rate, according to the people who are promoting the policy. So they may be overstating the case. Well, two-tenths of the growth rate, if the cost of that is it makes us, you know, we should be willing to undo, to not take that as long as that choice would sort of bridge a third of the inequality gap between us and Sweden. And so I think there's a real, there is a real trade-off here, and the idea that you shouldn't uh, think about the growth effects and you should only think about inequality, I think, probably doesn't quite go through here. I actually sort of had some trouble trying to figure out what it was Jason was saying, because I read the first draft, and when he says, you know, what you should do, let's go back to it, he says what you should do is focus exclusively on distributional analysis and not worry at all about growth. I read that as being a statement about policymaker preferences. If you're a policymaker, stop caring about growth, go back and care about inequality, and only inequality. Um, and I think if that's the reading of it, that's clearly too strong, um, and I think too strong by an order of magnitude. Jason told me last night, he said, no, no, Justin, you've misread Furman. And now I've read Furman nearly as many times as he's read Furman, um, <laughs> but he is Furman. Um, <laughs> So he said that it's not a statement about policymaker preferences or indifference curves, it's a statement about the menu of choices. And so because he's a public finance economist, what he's used to doing is analysing Republican tax schemes. And there's two types of Republican tax schemes. There's those that don't do much for growth and don't increase inequality by much. And there's those that don't do much for growth and increase inequality a lot. <laughs> and if that's the menu that you get to choose from, then the advice that what you ought to do is, uh, is think only about inequality and not at all about growth is right. And I think my quibble, and it really is only a quibble, is that Jason's advice is exactly right for public finance economists working during Republican administrations. Um, but I don't think it's generally good advice for thinking beyond public finance or beyond the US and possibly even in democratic administrations. Um, in fact, if, if, if you come back here, uh, oh, sorry, could you just bring up slide six? If you look here, the variation in GDP across countries is enormous. And that variation, we think, reflects policies and institutions and choices. And so it looks like, actually, there's a great deal of different things that policymakers could do, rather than just choosing between a, a bad and a terrible Republican tax plan. There's actually a lot that they can do. Um, and, um, and those have enormous impacts for well-being and they're enormous relative to the effects of inequality on well-being, um, which, is I'm, which is why I think Jason I th to really is overstating the extent to which one can afford to ignore the growth effects of uh, public policies broadly defined beyond thinking about Republican tax plans. That, that was terrific, Justin. Um, if I could ask our three speakers, one second, if I could ask our three speakers to come up and I'll join them on the panel in a moment, I have to say one joking thing and then put one question to before Larry gets in. Um, just the joking thing, but I'm seriously proud that our non-resident colleagues, Justin and Jason, have continued the PIE tradition of lively internal debate, uh, even as they only are here part-time. Um, let me put forward two questions. Um, first one to be a bit of a stinker. Um, all of you, I think, pretty carefully, if I followed the writings and the speeches correctly, never mentioned the words race or gender. And a lot of what people think about when they think about inequality is that it's not just about the income distribution, it's about people identified in certain groups are treated differently than others or have different, persistently different outcomes than others. I mean, Tharman, of course, mentioned the, the regional differences that persist, and that's another aspect of that. But whether it's Singapore as a multi-ethnic society, Australia dealing with its Aboriginal peoples and its immigrants, Jason dealing with, I shouldn't say Aboriginal, indigenous peoples and, and immigrants, and Jason, like the rest of us in the US, dealing with our divisions. That actually matters, at least politically, and I think arguably justice-wise, and I know you all believe that. 
but you didn't speak about that. Is uh, you've all been two of the three of you have been serious policymakers. How should policy, macro policy take that into account, or is it just that's somebody else's problem? We just maximize growth without doing anything horribly unfair and worry about it later. I guess I would say that's an area where I find the all good things go together way of thinking about it quite plausible that if you're excluding groups from your economy and your society, you're missing out on a bunch of potential that you could have in economic growth. I think to the first order, you see countries around the world that, um, that do that, and so that would be a good example. I think in other places, though, it's an example of where um, you might have to worry about trade-offs. You look at um, Blau and Kahn's work explaining the differences in female labor force participation between the United States and Europe, and they find that it's because Europe has paid leave and childcare, so women stay in the workforce, and so they do much better in female labor force participation. Um, they, in their same paper, say women are less in management positions in Europe than they are in the United States. Um, I think that should be a challenge to us to think harder if there's some way around that trade-off. But you know, I think in some places there may actually be trade-offs like that, and we need to think harder about you know which which end of that um, we want to be on. And that's sort of broadly motivating part of the argument I was making is that if you try to put all good things, everything into an all good things go together, inequality is always bad for growth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, sort of means you're not thinking about some of the trade-offs and tough choices. And so one option is to confine yourself to a very limited set of policies for which that's true, which I don't think is very good. Another is to delusionally trick yourself into thinking that a much wider set of things fit into that quadrant than actually belong there. Um, and a third is to think hard, um, maybe Justin's way rather than my way, about the things that fall outside that quadrant. Thank you. Tharman? Just, just two points. First, I think on gender, uh, we should never lose sight of the fact that the um, biggest story there is in the developing world. The most egregious uh, situations of unequal opportunity on the developing world and the uh, story of um, uh, female access to education and transition from primary to secondary education in particular um, is, is still a, a, a very challenging one in sub-Saharan Africa, in uh, South Asia, and in parts of East Asia. Um, it's, it, it borders on the criminal, what's happening today. So that's the big story, and the World Bank and others are quite focused on it but it's, it's by far the largest gender story in the world. Race is everywhere. And I think that uh, we still haven't mined the, uh, the uh, implications of the work over the last five years or so uh, in the US and elsewhere about the criticality of neighborhood factors and the difference between segregated and integrated neighborhoods. It's a very important part of public policy uh, in our case in Singapore, we addressed it because it was a necessity. It was almost an existential issue uh, to allow a multicultural society to not only survive but do reasonably well. Uh, but uh, I think that whole set of work coming out of um, you know, Raj Chetty and others who've been working on this suggests that there are more implications than, than merely have to do with having uh, a decent... Uh, relationships between people of different races, many more implications for social mobility and for economic outcomes that come from social urban planning. Whether housing is integrated or segregated is a critical fact uh, that determines macro outcomes, social outcomes, uh, and it shapes uh, life opportunities. And I think that's a very rich area of public policy that has been neglected in the past, uh, and, and we should pay attention to it. It's been some time since someone complained I didn't talk enough about race and gender. Um, so <laughs> I appreciate you, that. Um, the, you know, uh, I, I'm with Jason in putting this in the win-win quadrant. Um, it's a very easy one to put in there. Uh, good for equity, good for growth. Um, and it's a particularly politically important one because it's really damn impolite for people to disagree with you on this one. Um, they end up sounding like assholes. Um, 
But I think there's actually real reasons to be quite macroeconomically optimistic. The first is, you know, one way of thinking about this, the macroeconomist way, I think, would be it's a misallocation problem. We've got the wrong people and the wrong jobs. Um, Labor economists would add to that that there's also potential serious multiplier effects. One of the reasons people don't invest in human capital while they're young is they expect to be discriminated against while they're older. So if you remove the l likelihood of um, discrimination, you're going to get a lot more human capital investment in certain communities. Um, and then I think it's also worth going a step further and thinking about this in terms of its impact for growth. Um, th if, you, if your model of the world was a simple Paul Roma growth model and you move from a world in which um, only half the population can think of ideas that are going to revolutionize the earth to one in which the whole world can do that, then you've just doubled the number of potential inventors um, and in the simplest version of those models doubled the growth rate. Um, and so it could be that the emancipation of women is, is the, the greatest boost to growth that will happen in our lifetimes. Thank you. My second quick question, being unfair to Jason's fabulous paper by going outside it is that we started yesterday, as you know, focusing on a lot of business cycle issues and Olivier and Larry talking about stabilization policy. And for very good reason, the focus of this panel so far has been on issues of structural reform or long-term growth. But when, say, a monetary policymaker or we're designing automatic stabilizers for a fiscal policymaker thinks about those issues, thinks about issues, does the different incidents of, say, unemployment in the business cycle that say in the U.S. it's always at young African-American males who have the highest delta on unemployment, should that be taken into account when you're trying to determine your reaction function for business cycle stabilization? Or not? I mean, I, mean, I think, I can't remember if it was Olivier or someone else who was talking about automatic stabilizers having a microeconomic motivation, which is consumption smoothing. <coughs> And, of course, the things that do the best consumption smoothing at a micro level are going to be very well correlated with the thing, are going to be very much the things that have the highest multiplier from a macroeconomic perspective. So if you're delivering money to people in states of the world where their income is, is temporarily lower because they lost their job, um, they're going to spend a lot of that money. So I think, you know, the micro perspective, I, I don't know how differently you'd design some of these automatic stabilizers if you were just thinking about that set of considerations um, versus the broader macro. I think the macro comes in in things like, if you're worried about moral hazard and unemployment insurance, you're probably more worried about that when the unemployment rate is 3% and you're choosing not to work because you love your benefits than when the unemployment rate is 15% and you can't actually find a job, and that's the reason that um, you're not working. I'll just say very quickly that um, it's worth thinking about whether uh, hysteresis um, uh, does vary. Um, the, the incidence uh, and persistence of hysteresis does vary across different groups. And what role the combination of implicit or explicit discrimination as well as internal group dynamics uh, plays uh, in those different observed um, uh, persistences. Uh, casually, it does appear that there's a more complicated um, situation of um, hysteresis uh, for, for some groups compared to others. And um, that's one reason why counter-cyclical policy is important, but it has to be more than that. It has to be an activist social strategy to deal with these problems. I, I just want to add one point to what Thurman just said, because I think he's exactly on the money. Growing up as a labor economist in the US, hysteresis never much resonated here, because every time we have a recession, unemployment gets back to or below 5% within a few years. And it seems like the theories of uh, Blanchard and Summers and others wrote down to explain Europe don't work here. Except if you look at the black male non-employment rate for the US, uh, it looks like France and much of, it looks like Spain it looks like much of the rest of Europe. Um, and this may be because of the concentrated effects. And so there are hysteresis effects that sometimes play out at possibly as a result of the concentrated effects of business cycles. Thank you very much. Larry Summers. I thought Jason wrote a terrific paper in the very particular sense that it made a troublingly persuasive case for a proposition that I would have previously thought insane. Um, <laughs> that, proposition be, that proposition being the idea that uh, 
policymakers should essentially only pay attention to growth if they concluded that the effects on fairness of policies were a tie. This is actually goes back to a long Washington think tank tradition. Uh, this was the basic central mode of analysis of the Brookings Institution in the 1960s and early 1970s. And Marty Feldstein regarded it as his holy mission um, to instruct a generation of graduate students, of whom Alan Auerbach was another one, that that was all wrong. So this all has a certain sense of uh, f a certain sense of familiarity. Let me see if I understand what's going on, and then let me pose two challenges. I think the essence of what your conclusion is based on is there isn't much variation in growth rates among rich countries, and you don't think much can happen with policy to change growth rates, and you think you can do reasonably significant things, and lots of things have reasonably strong effects on inequality, so you might as well worry about, so you might as well worry about that. And yes, if you could turn, um, the, if, you, if, you, if you could turn Ghana into America, that would be much more important than anything about inequality, but we don't know how to do that, and so growth rates are kind of always going to be around 1%, and you're not going to change them much, so you might as well, so, you, so fairness becomes more important. I think that's the essence of what's driving uh, your result. And I guess I would pose two questions about it. One is, it seems to me you leave out one high-order effect entirely, which is, if you do anything that raises growth rates, some fraction of that is likely to get translated into more generous public investment and redistribution programs of one kind or other, and that it's not an accident that in recessions we tend to be most cruel uh, to the safety net. And so the effect of growth and greater prosperity on generosity is something that at least needs to be weighed into the analysis to the extent that you can do it. And the second is, do you really believe the impact of, uh, do you really believe these calculations about how good or bad uh, growth policies are, or do you think that that's kind of what we can measure? My guess is somebody could look at Singapore between 1960 and 1990 and could do a calculation about the social fund and do a calculation about the return to human capital, and they could do that calculation, and they'd successfully explain 12% of Singapore's growth, uh, of, of Singapore's growth, and then you could say, well, you know, Singapore's really lucky in its culture, and it's really lucky to be an island state, and it's really lucky to have a lot of Chinese people and all that. Or you could say, actually, we may not precisely understand the mechanisms with our little Harburger triangles, but the good policies probably had more to do uh, with the growth. You know, the academic way of saying that is endogenous growth theory translates level effects into growth effects. And so isn't it possible that you're substantially underestimating the growth benefits of good growth policies? So I agree with your statement of my thesis. I thought that was very good. My statement of my argument. And I agree with, uh, and I'm torn about both of your objections to it. So let me talk about that and address some things Justin raised because I have the microphone. Uh, um, you know, Justin, first of all, um, you know, Justin showed these things and Dollar and Cray did them ages ago, which if you look at the levels, they line up exactly. So if you're choosing between being in <coughs> Central African Republic or the United States, absolutely, we don't care about the genies in those two. You'd rather have the GDP of the United States than the Central African Republic. If you look at that in growth rates, they're still correlated but the correlation is not the straight line that you see there. And you know, the table I showed you is an example of that. Over the last 20 years, the United States per capita growth rate has been 1.5%. France's has been 
If you're looking at the growth rate, you'd be much more enthusiastic about the United States. But you look at median income, you look at the bottom quintile, you look at the OECD's super fancy measures, or you look at um, Justin's uh, mean log income, every one of those, France has very significantly outpaced um, the United States. And by the way, the main difference between the United States and France isn't in our productivity. Our productivity levels are about the same. It's that they work less in France. So that difference between those two from a welfare perspective um, greatly overstates the, the superiority of the United States um, to the, the Rep Republic of France. Um, so I do think there is a really big difference between the two. I think the difference is even larger when you're looking at the policy deltas. What social scientists need to look at, care about is, if you're a rich country or a poor country, how are you doing? For a policymaker, it is a policy delta. And I think policy deltas can move those two in more different ways than just the average of all the different things that moves you um, along those lines. And that would be the first thing. Second thing, um, you know, absolutely, there are large policies that can make a large difference on growth. I'm a little bit torn when I look at tax reform, for example. Those models have things like the cost of capital in them. They don't really have that a lot of talented people get distracted into obsessing themselves over accounting rather than obsessing themselves with innovating in some other dimension. They um, don't have that the tax treatment of R&D may have spillovers and may show up in a growth rate on a sustained basis um, rather than just you know, the level effects you get there. When you look at the difference between countries, it does seem to be a lot larger than quantifying the individual differences um, that we can quantify. So I find it plausible that that's the case. On the other hand, um, you know, or, or the trade, the PIIE work on trade, I think, don't tell me if I'm mischaracterizing it, I think it didn't include supply chain effects. And that's right. one of the things we'd worry about quite a lot and would make that in the real world probably a lot bigger. Um, on the other hand, it had a 45% tariff on China sustained for the next 10 years with massive retaliation on China. So I think the experiment I showed you is probably um, conditional on that happening, the growth effect would be larger, um, but that's not what's actually going to uh, actually going to happen. Hopefully, um, thanks in part to that work educating us on why it's a bad idea. So I am torn. I think that might be the case, but on the other hand, I also think, as Justin said, a certain number of the estimates I gave you are from the people that like the policies they're estimating or don't like them, and they're skewing it a little bit in that direction too. That. You look at growth rates of advanced economies after t major tax changes. They don't look for it. Greg Epp had uh, the, you know, the unscientific and, and more persuasive than many scientific versions of that in an article um, he wrote. And so, yeah, and you look at the small differences in growth rates, and it could be that some place has some good policies and some bad, and other place has some bad and some good, and you're looking at the average of all of those. So you can't infer from that. Um, in terms of the generosity, I've thought less about that. It seems plausible and possibly important, but it also sounds a little bit to me like the idea that trade is a compensated Pareto improvement, and then you get the free trade, you never get the compensated Pareto improvement. And so the idea that our strategy should be to get as much GDP as possible and then figure out how to fairly distribute it is not something I'd count on as much. No, I, I think that comparison is a little unfair. I mean, it, maybe it's an accident that the country prospered incredibly between the 1950s and the early 60s, and then it decided to have the Great Society. But I, I don't. I'm not. I don't think it's analogous to the. I don't think it's analogous to the trade thing. I mean, if you read Ben Friedman's book on the moral consequences of growth, it's making. A strong, it, it's making a strong case, and you know it, it, this. This was uh, implicit in uh, it wasn't quite the way he put it, but I, I, this that's what I got out of one Tharman's comments. Uh, uh, Tharman sort of made the point that relativities and resent re resentment over relativity rises in tough times. Now you know you could argue on the other side that. Social Security was born of the was was born of the Depression, um, and 
which goes which would go the other way. I but think I Affordable think, Care Act came after a period of very slow income growth and a deep recession. You, you, so. you can you can argue about it. I think the I, th- I think I'm I think I'm correct. I think the two things I'm fairly confident I'm correct in stating are that it's a high order issue for any conclusion about the relative importance of growth and equity, and that there's a substantial body of previous uh, thought asserting what I asserted, that growth makes you more gener- more generous and more oriented to uh, provide uh, to providing pub- to providing public goods. Um, I I have gone through a set of social policy examples, and I think you could argue it both ways. I think you'll end up deciding that on net the effect goes over the long run in the direction I suggest. Um, we have so many. We have so many people waiting to ask questions. We have. 10 to, if I'm nice, 15 minutes left. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask the people at the back, Mike, we'll take two questions at a time. And if you could just designate, you can say all, but if you want to designate a particular speaker to address them to, please. Thank you. German Zettelmeyer, Peterson Institute. So, so this is mainly for, for Jason, a little bit in, in the sa- same vein. So I, I'm very sympathetic to the main conclusion for advanced countries, but I do think that maybe you are skewed a little bit by the US experience, right? And so, so basically the intuition is, you know, we have policies that have second order effects on growth, but first order effects on distribution, so we should pay more attention to distribution. But I think the reason you say that is also because distribution is really a first order problem in the US in a way that it is not in many European countries. And so for Europe, I'm really hesitant uh, to adopt your recommendation, even though the absolute um, kick of uh, you know growth policy packages may not be very different, but for Europe, you know whether you're growing a quarter of, of a percent more or less on potential is is really really crucial. Whereas you know distribution, yeah, it's an issue, but maybe it's not not such an important issue. The, the IMF and the Europeans have been arguing endlessly over, over a quarter percent growth projections for Greece, for example. So it matters a lot. Thank you. If we could get the next question, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, great presentations. And um, Jason, I really do agree with I'm you sorry, on the. Do you identify yourself, please? Uh, yeah, Heather Boucher, Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Um, Jason, I really do agree with you on the, the long run productivity, the set of studies that you talked about, that there is this very compelling literature um, on the micro side, especially um, around children. I have two very quick questions. Um, First is, I'm surprised that you haven't talked at all about the issue of stability. So I think the most compelling cross-national studies in recent years have been about the effect of inequality on not growth, but growth spells. And um, in the opening conversation, um, Olivier talked about earthquakes and um, made some mention of inequality playing a role there. I wondered if any of you could speak to that. And then second, um, I think this is maybe more for you, Jason, but perhaps for anyone. Um, you know, you commented a little bit about um, issues around rent and antitrust, um, but then sort of noted the the median voter theory of um, how political decisions are made. Of course, there's a lot of evidence from political science now that inequality, at least in the U.S. case, this high incomes at the top are um, fr- teeing up what is actually on the policy agenda. And so I wonder if you could speak to the role that in- high-end income inequality is playing, especially in the policy issue areas, around antitrust and competition. Okay, great, thanks so much. And the growth spell paper is by German who asked the question right before you. So um, German's question puts me in a quandary because I have pretty much two axioms in thinking about these issues. One is that um, effects on growth are second order relative to effects on distribution. And the second is that I should think about Europe, whatever German tells me to think about Europe. And in this case, these two are, are in conflict. Um, so, I, you know, I do understand that, and, and I do think that set of, you know, I would find Larry and Justin's criticisms more persuasive if they were less a theoretical claim and more could identify something where they could plausibly convince me that this looks quite bad on distributional grounds, but here's what the growth is, here's where people would be after a decade, here's the elasticity of 
increased, you know, EITC payment legislation relative to GDP and, you know, calculate all of that. And I would look at it and be sorry. So I, so I still think I need something more like that than just um, a general assertion. I've given some examples. They're all from the tax space. Um, Danny added an extra example, which I haven't thought through on um, the trade space. So I think to some degree, some of this is a policy by policy thing for the policies where I am capable of thinking about it. I think this rule isn't too far off. There's certainly things I could be contemplating otherwise, and I look forward to your specific examples later, Jeremy. Oh, oh sorry, oh, I, I, I didn't get to Heather's at all. Um, on the growth spells, um, you know, I, I think I, I sort of like that, but I think you know, if you were trying to do better macro stabilization, the question of how you should be doing your price level targeting and how you should change your automatic stabilizers and a bunch of things like that would be, I think, way more important than, you know, a change in the Gini coefficient for what those cycles were like. One big important caveat to that, the United States has better automatic stabilizers today than we had a decade ago because we have higher taxes on high-income people, lower taxes on low-income people in the Affordable Care Act. So in general, if you look at automatic stabilizers, they are pretty well correlated with the size of government. And then in so far, then the second factor that's a little bit less important but matters also is how progressive your policies are. So more progressive redistributional policies are in a sense giving people better insurance at a point in time against different outcomes and um, giving you better automatic stabilizers for the consumption smoothing we we're talking about. So I think there's a relationship there, but it's motivated a little bit more for me by the micro public finance side than it is the macro research as much as I like. Hey, the let me, one. let me, I'm not going to debate Jason because he's smarter than me, but let me, let me make two points. First is I think this is not as clear cut about how much the automatic stabilizers have gone up in, in some real sense in the U.S. I think the, the, there were things in that direction, but going back to some things Olivier said and Larry said at the start yesterday and then Jay Shamba made very clear in our fiscal panel, thinking about what more optimally designed automatic stabilizers in various senses is extremely important. And in Europe, that's going on now a little bit at the Euro level. And so rather than just sort of leave it there, I think this is something we actually have to work on as a profession and as this group. Second thing I would say is, especially to give Danny Roderick his due, when you're mentioning things that are predictors across countries of the extent of stabilizers in the welfare state, openness is very key. Uh, Danny established that result a long time ago, that more open societies have more redistribution, more stabilization, perhaps to compensate for being more volatile, but when you're listing what counts, yeah. you have to include right. that. Yeah, strongly agree. Our automatic stabilizers are very much inadequate. Part of how one can improve them is not change the size of government, but have unemployment insurance go up even more in recessions and down even more in booms, and the average amount of unemployment um, insurance would be the same. But another part of how to improve them is to have a larger government with higher taxes and more progressivity. And if you do the math on that, um, you get you get a lot more automatic stabilizers out of it, and it goes in your direction. On the second, yeah, I think in thinking about very top-end inequality and the degree to which it's attributable to rents is, um, is a powerful framework for it. I think the first best there is if we could think of some way to get at those rents in an efficient manner. Um, maybe we don't, you know, maybe antitrust is too blunt a tool, and we don't want 13 Facebooks because we all want to be on the same social network as our friends, and so then you just want to do it through the tax system. Uh, the last question for this session. Uh, Jacob Kierkegaard at the Peterson Institute. A uh, quick question. Should public policy tend to address uh, only after tax and transfers types of income, or should it and can it care about market income uh, inequality as well? Because, I mean, if you start thinking about things like bonus caps and things like that, which would address uh, market income inequality, uh, but on the other hand, if we really solely talk about after tax and transfers inequality, recalling that you know, mark on a market income basis, the U.S. is not actually worse off than many European countries, that seems to reduce income inequality can policies to basically issues about taxes and transfers. Let me ask the Deputy Prime Minister to so respond this is to that. Really for everyone. Yeah. yeah. So just very briefly, I think uh, the reason why I said. Um, 
that this narrative of compensating the losers uh, is, is a bad one uh, is because it takes as given the pre-distribution uh, outcomes uh, and thinks that the solution is to be, to be progressive and nice and uh, uh, empathetic to those who've lost out. When the real challenge, uh, before we think about redistribution, is about regeneration. Uh, and we know it can be done because some places do it better than others. Um, the, the Swedes do it better than uh, many other advanced countries, for example. Uh, Singapore tries hard to do it. It can be done. So helping people to adjust to the inevitable vicissitudes brought upon by globalization and technology has to be a central theme in public policy. And it's developing not just, not just providing the fiscal resources, but it's developing the institutions and those communities of learning that I spoke about. It happens to be also something that gives people a lot more sense of optimism and confidence about themselves uh, compared to having to rely on redistribution. I'm not saying that we don't need redistribution. We probably need more of it in future compared to the past, but it is secondary in a very fundamental and profound sense to the idea of helping people to regenerate themselves and helping places to regenerate themselves. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to give him one last Carmen, word? Carmen, can you, can you just add a thought on um, the other thing people are talking about when they talk about pre-distribution, which is not helping people help themselves, but is stuff like caps on executive pay and minimum wage and minimum wages and sort of direct intervention in the marketplace reward system and how you view that? I would say, and you can add uh, UBI to that if you want. Um, I think, um, you know, there's so much work to be done in helping people to improve their incomes by improving their capabilities and skills. Um, the countries that do it better uh, tend to be ones where you also have a little less of a hierarchy at the workplace and within the firm between the woman or man at the top and those below. Um, and they tend to be ones where there's a social norm that constrains uh, the excesses or the excessive divergences in pay. And I think those are actually good social models that we can all learn from, uh, that Singapore can learn from. Um, it's best achieved when it is social norms that do the capping uh, and do the uplifting at the bottom uh, than through regulation per se, because you know, the debate is endless, but uh, there, there are uh, unintended losses that come about when you do it uh, through regulation. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm afraid we've already run this a bit over. Um, we're going to take a 12 minute coffee break um, for those of you offline and those of you thinking about going away, don't. We have not only a fabulous panel, I mentioned international economic rock stars. We're fortunate to have with us Carmen Reinhardt and Raghu Rajan for the next panel, and that's pretty international economic, pretty rock star. So please come back at 10.30 sharp. <laughs>